Welcome once again to Lato's Law. Here's Steve Lato. I had a lot of people send me this story. It's widely reported in a bunch of different sources, including CNBC, and it involves Tesla. Tesla returns were supposed to be easy, but this customer has been waiting more than two years for a Model X refund. Laura Kolodny wrote the story, and there is some confusion in the story because some of the facts are not clear. You have to understand, I am an attorney who specializes in lemon law, and over my career, I've gotten hundreds and hundreds and hundreds of cars bought back by manufacturers. And there's a process whereby a manufacturer buys a vehicle back. Now, generally speaking, it's a little different here because Tesla is also the seller of the vehicle. And my clients, uh, at least the ones who have non-Tesla vehicles, vehicles were bought back by the manufacturer after being sold by a dealership. But That shouldn't change the mechanics of how this works. So here's the story. The man bought a new Tesla Model X and took delivery of the car in February of 2020. Three days later, he informed the company he was returning the electric SUV under the seven-day, no-questions-asked policy that CEO Elon Musk was touting at the time. Today, more than two years later, uh, the man still doesn't have his refund or access to the vehicle which had a price tag of around $116,000, including various options and fees. Records indicate that Tesla did pick up his Model X, loaded it onto a tow truck on March 8, 2020, after which he expected to get a prompt refund. His bank advised him to ask Tesla to initiate a stop sale. That's what he recalls. And then his Tesla sales representative informed him that his refund would be processed soon. So the question is, how much of this was reduced to writing? And I'm not quite sure what a stop sale is, uh, unless it's a banking term. But generally speaking, if a vehicle gets sold in America, the state has paperwork that gets processed to put the title of the vehicle into the new owner's name. Okay? So if the manufacturer is buying the vehicle back, then... That process, if it's been completed, simply just has another process added where it gets, quote-unquote, sold back to the manufacturer. Or that process hasn't been started yet. Presumably, there's some way they could stop that. But there is a little bit of a difference when we're talking about buying and selling automobiles versus buying and selling, you know, pens or widgets or something, where you've actually got to do this particular paperwork. Instead, several weeks later, as he was still corresponding with Tesla, The man received a service alert from Tesla telling him to come pick up his SUV. The the alert explained that it had been repaired and was in a service center in Burbank, California, although he had originally purchased the vehicle in Century City about 40 minutes away. Now, the man's told CNBC he was astounded by the service alert. He says he never asked for nor authorized repairs and that Tesla has previously acknowledged that he was returning the car. So, CNBC says that they've seen the correspondence between the man and Tesla, which confirm his account. So he he says that he's got this correspondence, and CNBC says they've seen it, and the correspondence indicates that he says, I'm returning my car, and they said, yes, you are. Something to that effect. He stopped making payments on the car for a month because he thought everything was moving along properly. Then the bank told him that he had missed a payment and that his credit rating had taken a 30-point hit. When he called to ask about it, he was told that Tesla had not issued the stop sale. And as far as they knew, he was still the owner of the vehicle for which he should be making payments. As the owner of a small business that gives biking and hiking tours in Southern California, the man says he needed to maintain a strong credit rating. So given the situation, he decided he had no choice but to keep making car payments to his bank and to pay to keep the car insured as well, because that's the collateral on the loan and his name is on the loan. He wanted to avoid any repossession by the bank, and he knew the financial institution could have wrecked his credit further if he didn't keep up the payments. He kept up the insurance payments in case damage happened to the vehicle while it was in Tesla's possession. Uh, And he says, if you stop paying your bank, that will destroy you. As a result, for the last two years, the man's been making payments on a car he does not possess. He believes that Tesla promised to buy the car back from him, but so far they've taken no steps to do so. Tesla did not respond to a request for comment by the news organizations. So the man says he bought the car because he's a fan of Tesla, that he read that the Model X had a great safety rating, 
and he believed driving a battery electric vehicle would minimize the environmental footprint of his personal transportation. And I will get some pushback on that whenever I mention Tesla and electric cars. People chime in about the cost-benefit analysis of electric versus ICE, and that's not the point. You know, you're allowed to shop for a car and buy it for any reason you like. And if you like the color green, you can buy a green car and go, I bought it because I like green. And you can jump in the comments section and go, green's an ugly color on a car. All you want, sure, in your opinion. So there you go. So <laughs> the man had a young child at the time. He was concerned about safety. And as the owner of the Sustainable Outdoor Adventure Company, he felt that the battery-powered electric car was a good way to underscore his commitment to the uh, nature. Car was marketed with a battery that had more than a 400-mile range essential for driving from Southern California to the San Francisco Bay Area. Uh, and so that's what he was also looking at. When he first took the Tesla Model X out, the vehicle's range indicator said that he had drained 15 miles from the battery after he had driven less than a half mile from his home. When he tried to recharge the vehicle's high-voltage battery in the first day he had the car, uh, he said it took far longer than the sales reps had promised it would, and uh, he was upset by that. He also shared photos with CNBC of the vehicle's display and charging status from that trip. Uh, even before the time he spent plugged in at a charging station, he said he had already waited more than an hour to get access to a charger because there's a huge line of cars in front of him. So besides battery issues, he said that one of the vehicle's falcon wing doors was sticking when he tried to open it, and he found that installing a charger at his apartment complex would cost 10 times what he had been told by reps that it would. The sales reps said he could install a charger at his home for about 700 bucks. And they knew he lived in an apartment building, but instead quoted a price for a charger in a standalone garage. So he says he's got all kinds of reasons why he was unhappy with the vehicle. So in the spring of 2019, Elon Musk said to his millions of followers on Twitter, quote, to be clear, orders are fully refundable, even after you've had your Tesla for a week. If someone really wants to return the car in good faith on day eight, that's fine, unquote. So the man returned his car. At one point... Messages to the man from Tesla show the company tried to convince him that it didn't have a seven-day return policy when he bought the vehicle. Now, Tesla did have a return policy on its website until October of 2020, which is months after this man bought and returned his Model X. The return policy also was mentioned in the sales contract. After three months of back and forth with the company, including being told his refund was arriving soon, then being told he could pick it up he filed a lawsuit against the company. To his surprise, instead of being able to proceed in court, he was informed his case be sent to an alternative dispute resolution process. Tesla's got an arbitration clause in their contract, or at least they did in this one. So when he signed the paperwork to take delivery of the Model X, he had agreed to arbitration instead of litigation. So his predicament now regarding the Model X highlights the vulnerability of U.S. consumers who are pushed into arbitration agreements in order to purchase services or items as a matter of course. Now, of course, the question is, if he goes to arbitration, he can still win. It's not like you're going to lose automatically if you go to arbitration. Um, mandatory arbitration is common in new and used auto sales, says Paul Bland, Executive Director of Public Justice, a consumer advocacy group. Uh, it depends what state you're in and a few other things. For all practical purposes, consumers get nothing out of agreeing to arbitrate, he says. For companies, however, their motivation is to cap liability and to make it harder for consumers to win an individual case if they did something illegal. Uh, this is Bland speaking. It is such a secretive system that it's much harder for consumers to find out what happened to people in previous related cases, and it makes it harder for there to be a class action. And most of these arbitration agreements also say, and you agree not to do a class action. Now, the man here says if you realize the company is not being honest with him about the car and the return process, he would not have purchased the car and he would not have agreed to arbitration. His arbitration is still pending. Meanwhile, he's had to lease another car to use in place of the Model X. He told CNBC he is leasing a hybrid electric Toyota. Every time the money gets sucked out of my account, every month I just cringe. Besides that, I've spent over 100 hours of my life trying to fix this and just worrying. So... In February of this year, Tesla sent the man a message telling him his car, which he hadn't seen in almost two years, was ready to be picked up at a service center. So he then emailed them and said he'd come pick it up. 
But then they wouldn't make an appointment for him to do so. They told him to call his bank instead, and that didn't get him anywhere. So meanwhile, his vehicle is sitting someplace, uh, and he, quote, unquote, returned it. And at the time, he says Tesla had a return policy. And after fighting back and forth about this, uh, wanted to file a lawsuit, and discovered you can't. you got to go through arbitration. A couple of things I should point out here is that if you buy something, a large item, a car, and you buy the large item from a dealership or from a factory, if it's Tesla, and someone else finances it, a bank, okay? We'll refer to them as a bank, although they could be like Ford Motor Credit, right? But I'm going to refer to the bank as the entity that lends the money. And what you have is called a purchase money security interest. Somebody lends you money, the purchase money, and in exchange for that, you're going to make payments and you grant them a security interest in what you're buying as collateral. So you might know that if you go to borrow money from somebody, they might say, do you have any collateral? And if you're putting up as collateral the thing you're buying with the money you're borrowing, it's called a purchase money security interest. <laughs> there is a federal statute as well as state statutes, and they're often called holder rules, H-O-L-D-E-R. And they refer to the person who's holding the note, and the holder of the note is the bank. So that if you buy a car from a seller, be it a dealership or a manufacturer, and the purchase money was lent by somebody else as a security interest for what you're buying, purchase money, security interest. This is where my show gets really complicated. I'm sorry. The holder rule says that the lender stands in the same shoes as the seller. So all claims and defenses you have against the seller, you have against the lender. And some people go, wait, what? <laughs> you mean you can hold them liable for the defective car? Yes, you can. Yes, you can. Is it fair? Well, if it wasn't that way, they could benefit despite the fact that the car is defective, for instance. So I can tell you that in many Lemon Law lawsuits, you sue three entities. The seller, which is a dealer, the manufacturer, which built it, and the bank, which lent the money on it. And they have varying degrees of liability. And you might say, Steve, but why would you sue the bank? Well, if the vehicle gets bought back, we need the bank to cooperate on that because we want to switch the collateral out on the loan if it's, if it's a, a trade assist. Or if it's a buyback, we need them to actually not try to hold this up and say, hey, you signed a contract with us. you got to keep making payments to us on that defective car. No, no. So we sue them. And I actually can tell you right now, one of my best friends was an attorney for one of the biggest banks in Michigan. And I got to know him because I sued him so often. <laughs> We're friends now. He's retired. Hey, Dwayne, how you doing? And he's retired now. But I'm still friends with the guy. And, and they just understand that's, a, that's part of the cost of doing business. And they would show up in court and just say, we're just here because we're the lender. And, turn, and the judge would just say, okay, thank you. you, know, just, just, you know. And once in a while, they would get involved, but not very often. But the interesting thing is, I know some people, there's still somebody, I guarantee you out there is going, Steve, it still makes no sense. <laughs> I had a case once where a client of mine bought a defective product. I'm not going to see what the product is because it's silly, but it's irrelevant. My client bought a defective product, had it installed at his house, big product, and the product didn't work. He calls the dealership and goes, product doesn't work. He, they go, we'll get to it as soon as we can. Next thing he calls him, the phone's disconnected. Company went out of business. The, the dealership went out of business. So he, he calls the manufacturer and they go, don't know what to tell you, dude. We only had one dealer in your state. They're out of business. You're on your own, sucker. <laughs> Client calls me. He goes, what do I do now? I go, well, believe it or not, we filed a lawsuit against the bank, <laughs> the lender on this one. And he goes, really? I said, yeah. I, I go, all the claims and defenses you have against the seller, you have against the bank. Bank attorney called me up. Different one than the one I mentioned a second ago. It's not the same guy, just different guy. Bank guy calls me up. And it's somebody I don't even know. Don't even know who the guy, didn't know him before, haven't dealt with him since. Calls me up and goes, hey, Steve, I, I'm, I'm the attorney for the bank on this case that you just filed. He goes, we've done some research. He goes, the manufacturer is just hopeless. They won't deal with us. And the dealership, as you know, is out of business. I said, yeah. And he goes, uh, how about this? Um, your guy put a couple bucks down 
down payment on this product? And he put a very small amount down. I go, yeah. And he goes, we will forgive the rest of the loan. He can have it if he'll drop the lawsuit. How's that? I called up my guy and I said, I know you don't want to spend the $9,000 of the original contract, but if you can just have the product right now and it's considered paid in full, you happy with that? He goes, yes, take that. When you buy something brand new, you want it to be perfect and you're paying full price for it. When you get a 99% discount, you're okay with a few little flaws here and there. Now, this thing he had was defective, but he told me he thought he could get it fixed. And the cost of the fix wasn't totally insignificant, but it was going to cost him a couple bucks. But he didn't mind because he got to keep the thing when he was done. He was happy. He was happy. And that's actually, in my entire career, the only time I've had a case where the holder rule completely saved the case. But that's always the concern is that if you bought something and what you bought was a collateral on the loan and there's a lender saying, keep paying us, but the seller or the warrantor or whoever it is refuses to make this thing good, it's not your fault as the consumer. Should you keep making payments on a defective product to a lender when the seller won't take care of you? And so what this does in a roundabout way is it forces lenders to take a close look at what they're dealing with with respect to products and sellers that they're going to help with financing, okay? And so if there's somebody out there who's an unscrupulous operator, the bank's got to realize that we're getting in bed with these people. And if they do bad stuff, it's going to come back on us. And likewise, if they're selling garbage and the garbage is collateral on the loan, that's going to come back to haunt them also. So it forces the banks to do a little bit more homework. So what I'd be curious most about in this case is how much of this is actually in writing and does it actually say, you may return your vehicle to us, follow these instructions. Once you've done that, we will refund you. And then thank you for returning the vehicle. We will now refund you. If he's got those documents, it seems like a slam dunk. Now, the fact he's waited two years, if in fact he's waited this long, I'm not sure what that's all about. Because most people, I suspect, would have waited about 30 days and called an attorney. And it doesn't help anybody when cases get dragged out. Because that vehicle, when he had driven it for just a couple days and returned it within a week, that vehicle could have been cleaned up a little bit, repaired maybe, and sold to somebody else. But now that it's been sitting around for two years... And we don't know the you know the situation within which it's sitting. <laughs> it might not be worth as much, so that would not help anybody. So the faster these things happen, the better. So it's a, an unfortunate story that it's taken this long, but hopefully in arbitration it'll get straightened out, and that's possible. Um, I've arbitrated cases. I've had good results. I, I'm not so anti-arbitration that I don't think anybody should do it. It's just that the rules can be different, and it can be expensive, and sometimes. Uh, It can also be quite opaque, meaning that you look at it, you're not sure what you're going to get. But in litigation, it's easier to predict these things. But we'll see what happens. But as of right now, the guy is still waiting. Tesla returns were supposed to be easy, but this customer has been waiting more than two years for a refund on his Model X. That'd be Laura Kaladny who wrote it. CNBC published it, and about a million people sent it to me, give or take. (laughs) Questions or comments, put them below. Let's talk to you later. Bye-bye. Thank you for watching Lato's Law. Good, better, best. Never let it rest till your good is better and your better is best.